800 years ago, on a sandy marsh in the middle of a windy plain, building began. The story of Berlin and its buildings has been one of visionary creation, but also terrible destruction. More than any other city, Berlin has, over the centuries, been a place where men have cast their dreams in stone. Now, more than half a century after the Second World War and 20 years after the fall of the wall, Berlin is still a work in progress. The forest of cranes suggests a new version of the city is rising. But in Berlin, nothing is simple. Berlin is a city where the past and the future just keep colliding. I love this place, it fascinates me. But as a German, I also feel that some of its buildings, perhaps inevitably, inspire feelings of guilt. In fact, I can't really think of another city in the world where the morality of the architecture has been so heavily scrutinized and mulled over as here in Berlin. There is no such thing as just bricks and mortar here. Every fragment is charged with history, both good and bad. Stones that tell us about ourselves, our idealism, our hubris, our ambition, and of course, our delusion. This is a tale of rubble and remembrance, of mortar and morality. On the morning of the 3rd of May, 1945, weary Berliners emerged bleary-eyed from their cellars and their bomb shelters. And then it suddenly dawned on them. The war was over, but so was Berlin. What had been a proud metropolis in stone had now been reduced to a city of dust. For Berliners, this terrible moment would become known as Stunde Null, or Zero Hour. The victorious Allied commanders soon arrived. What Winston Churchill saw was an apocalyptic landscape that shocked even him. British Air Marshal Arthur Tedder had come to the city to accept the formal surrender of the Germans. He compared Berlin to a ruined classical city. In his opinion, it would never be rebuilt. At the center of this devastation was the wreck of a building familiar to all Berliners and that felt as old as the city itself. The Berliner Schloss. This is the Schloss in the 1930s 
It was a royal palace and had been home to Berlin's rulers for centuries. Originally a medieval fortress, it had been in typical Berlin fashion, built and rebuilt. In the mid-1700s, it settled on its final Baroque form. It was the heart of Berlin. By 1945, the Schloss stood for the fate of the city itself. Once the center of an imperial power, now reduced to a blackened shell. Es war alles grau. Es war alles so zerstört, Ruinen. Und der Rest, der nach dem Krieg noch stand vom Schloss, war für mich ein bedrückender Klops. After the war, control of the city was divided, with the Russians in charge of the East and the West controlled by the Americans, the British and the French. So in effect, there were now two Berlins, East and West. But facing both sides were millions of tons of rubble. Each Berlin sought to use the rubble creatively, as a building material, but also as a political tool. In Treptower Park, East Berlin, stands a vast memorial to the 5,000 Russian soldiers who died in the Battle of Berlin. Completed in 1949, the Soviet war memorial used slabs of red marble from Hitler's chancery, destroyed at the end of the war. The Russians recycled the stone that had formed the core of Hitler's world and created a memorial that was designed to make the victor feel proud and the vanquished pathetic. This is stone deployed as a propaganda tool intended to rub and keep rubbing German noses in their own defeat. But the Russians weren't the only ones looking to make a point with the spoils of war. On the western edge of the city, the British and American authorities used their rubble to create a hill. But this was no ordinary hill. And in the difficult years that were to come, it would prove of great strategic value. I've got the Cold War crunching under my feet here. hell freezing windy amazing look at this look at this stuff it's like a sail but of course this was once all completely enclosed not nearly as noisy in fact it was silent because everyone here would be listening to what was going on over there this was a listening post 
in the Cold War for what was going on in the East. Apparently they could listen to conversations being held 300 miles that direction. This is amazing. And it's almost impossible to imagine that this place, two decades ago, would have been absolutely jam-packed with technicians and spies. In fact, you can see some of the wires here. You can still see some of the old fuse boxes left behind. This is a vintage Cold War relic. Never seen anything like it. An extraordinary place. And remember, although we're on top of a mountain, this is in fact not made by nature, it was made by man. Millions of tons of rubble from the city of Berlin shipped here at the end of the Second World War to make the Teufelsberg, the Devil's Mountain. Couldn't find a better name for this place. Layer upon layer of history and right on top, like a white cherry on a green cake, the Cold War listening station. Only in Berlin. weird, but I love this place. The question is, what do you do with it? No one here can agree. I mean, there have been several suggestions. Turn it into a museum, leave it exactly as it is, make it into a hotel, why not have a spa? But no one here can agree. And the reason is that in Berlin, the act of demolition is just as politically and emotionally charged as the act of construction. It's the curse of this city. In the aftermath of the war, the need for new homes for the thousands of homeless Berliners became paramount. The post-war blues gave way to a new mood of optimism. It was a race, west versus east, to create a new model city that represented their way of thinking. The socialist boulevard of Stalin Alley, now called Karl Marx Alley, was a long, wide, processional avenue in East Berlin, constructed by thousands of willing workers. To its critics, the apartment blocks that lined it were crass and more suited to Moscow. To their new occupants, though, they were comfortable and modern. Many of the builders and their families were given apartments. Gerhard Walensky still lives there. Das war natürlich äh, gerade für uns und junge Eltern war das ein Märchenhaft, ne? Und äh, beschreiben Sie mir, wie das hier war, dieses Gebäude in der Karl-Marx-Allee zu bauen. Wir waren eine Jugendbrigade, alles junge Leute. Wir haben unsere, unsere äh, Witze gemacht, unsere Scherze gemacht, mhm. aber es hat eben Freude gemacht. Das war, also, Sie haben wirklich das Gefühl gehabt, dass Sie beim Wiederaufbau von Berlin ja. eine Rolle gespielt haben. Ja, 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 ja. Also das war wirklich ein, ein Gefühl, gebraucht zu werden. Nicht? Sie waren die Heldenmaurer Deutschlands damals. Naja, also wir wurden, wir wurden hofiert. Nicht? Also das, das, ist schon, das ist schon wahr. The response in West Berlin was ambitious and radical. The Interbau project brought together 48 renowned architects. Their task was to design social housing for the Hansa Viertel district that had been decimated by bombs. Mein Mann had a 8 mm camera. Mein Mann and I, we sind oft ins Hansa Viertel gefahren während der Ausstellung. 
Eines Tages war die Kleine mit unsere Katharina, sie war vier Jahre alt und hatte ein Spielzeug für Kinder entdeckt, eine Drahtschlange. Mein Mann stand mit dem Rücken vor unserem jetzigen Haus, ohne es zu wissen. Und fotografierte sie dabei, filmte sie dabei. Es erschien uns sehr, sehr modern. Da waren wir fassungslos für Glück in diesem zerstörten Berlin, wo es schon ungeheuer problematisch war, eine normale Wohnung zu finden, hatten wir dieses Haus. Heute schließe ich die Tür und schließe damit alles, was an der Stadt unsympathisch ist und gehe rein wie in ein gehütetes Nest. Ich fühle mich sehr, sehr beschützt in dem Haus. Umarmt. But the two new Berlins didn't define themselves by construction alone. The destruction of old buildings also became a creative and political act. Berlin's ruined royal palace, the Schloss, came in the firing line. Its remains stood in East Berlin, and the communist authorities there decided that with its imperial past, it represented the wrong kind of history. In 1950, it was demolished. Die erste Sprengung war unser Professor Weithas. Der hat uns wie ein Verrückter der sonst ein sehr ruhiger und netter Mensch war, hat er uns weggescheucht vom Fenster. Wir mussten verschwinden. Wir so. durften uns das nicht ansehen. Es war einfach traurig, nicht? dass alles so runterging. It was an ignominious end for what was, after all, Berlin's most historic building. And where the Schloss stood, today there's a vast sandy pit, once more an empty space at the heart of the city, waiting for answers. For a decade after the demolition of the Schloss, East and West Berlin became more and more divided. One Sunday in 1961, the East Berlin authorities began work on a structure that was to define the lives of all Berliners for nearly three decades. That day came to be known as Stacheldraht Sonntag, or Barbed Wire Sunday. The barbed wire would quickly be replaced by reinforced concrete. Arc lamps and guard towers watched over the notorious death strip. An exposed no-go area of bare sand that cut a huge swathe through the city. When the wall was built, it instantly became the most infamous and emotionally charged structure, not just in Berlin, but in the whole world. The people of the city had seen many grotesque things in the 20th century, but this was new. Ruthlessly, the wall cut everything in its path in half. Entire communities, neighborhoods, families, even the dead weren't sacred enough.
The buildings of Berlin used to fit in with the Schloss. Now they responded to the wall. Once more, East and West competed, this time for height. Right-wing press baron Axel Springer taunted the East Berlin authorities by commissioning a new headquarters in West Berlin, right next to the wall. Einigkeit und Recht und Freiheit. The communist response? Four new apartment blocks that put Springer's building in the shadow. But even these were dwarfed by another project in the east, the Fernsehturm, or TV Tower. Constructed in 1969 at over 360 meters tall, it quickly became a Berlin icon, visible right across the city, east or west. For the communists, it was a symbol of newness, of technology, of the future, proudly flaunted in the face of the West. But how could the communists replace this? It was now 20 years since the demolition of the Schloss, Berlin's royal residence. In 1973, construction finally began on a replacement. On the very spot where the Schloss had stood rose another palace, the Palace of the Republic. It was the seat of the East German Parliament, but it was also meant to be an open house for the people, and they made the most of it. Despite sneers from the West, it didn't take long for it to wedge in the hearts of East Berlin. Ja, ich habe schöne Konzerte gehört. Ich habe schöne Familienfeiern erlebt. Das war öfter und das war sehr schön. Ich habe das Haus als wichtig für unsere Stadt gesehen. Es war ein, ein neuer Mittelpunkt. Ich bin keine Architektin, kein Fachmann. Aber als Bürgerin. Oder Fachmann. Aber als Bürgerin dieser Stadt fand ich den Palast schön. Those who mourned the Schloss, though, looked rather less kindly on the building that had replaced it. Das war schon Raub, das war kein Diebstahl mehr. Ne? Das war ein Raub. Ne? When the Berlin Wall finally fell in 1989, the Palace of the Republic, a symbol of the communist East, was never likely to survive in a reunified city. In 2006, demolition began. Asbestos, said the government. Wrong history, claimed aggrieved East Berliners. Either way, the site became vacant once again. And the question hung over the empty space. What should be built here? 
a building that acknowledged the past or one that embraced the future. The thing about Berlin is that it's always been a new city, even when it was old. In the first half of the 19th century, it was little more than a provincial town. But architect Karl Friedrich Schinkel almost single-handedly transformed it. His passion had been ignited in 1806 when French soldiers marched into Berlin, led by Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. Karl Friedrich Schinkel watched as Napoleon's troops marched into his city. French occupation was to rouse his patriotic fervor, but he vented his anger and his rage by creating some of the city's finest buildings. In less than 30 years, Schinkel dreamt up a series of new state buildings including the Altus Museum, the city's first public museum. Schinkel used the elegance of ancient Greece to make a new city seem older than its years. Schinkel was to build his king and master a classical paradise, an Athens on the Spree. At last, Berlin was to become a European capital of consequence. And as a dreamer in stone, Schinkel's mind buzzed with ideas and forms. Not content with that, though, Schinkel also saw the future of architecture itself. And it came on a trip in 1826 to England. He sketched the grim mills and factories of Manchester and other northern towns, and he sketched them like a man possessed. Schinkel was torn. At heart, he was a romantic who yearned for beauty. But there was something about the industrial architecture that he encountered in England that excited him. Back in Berlin, he came up with a building that married the two and would take architecture in a wholly new direction. The Bauer Akademie was finished in 1836. Nothing like it had ever been built before in Berlin, or indeed anywhere else. Schinkel had dreamt up a building that was elegant in appearance, but pioneering in construction. The Bauer Akademie now only exists in architecture books. The original building, has long vanished from the city. Damaged during the war, the East Berlin authorities saw it as just another old ruin and demolished it in 1962. Today, though, in a city of ghosts, a doppelganger appears to be rising. But in Berlin, nothing is ever quite what it seems. Well, there's not much to see inside. But you know what? After two centuries of construction and destruction, they finally got the answer to their problems in this city of facades. Make them all out of plastic. The Bau Academy is where Schinkel died in 1841. From overwork, they said. 
The Berlin that he left behind was now on the verge of greatness. A city like Schinkel himself, both romantic and progressive. By the turn of the 20th century, Berlin had become the most modern city in the Western world. The American author, Mark Twain, was a new visitor, a man familiar with the great metropolises of Chicago and New York. But it was in Berlin that he saw the future. No other European capital could touch it for innovation. It had some of the first electric traffic signals and streetlights on the continent. Berlin fizzed with activity. And everything had to be beautiful. Even the transformer stations that powered the city were works of art. Peter Behrens was an architect obsessed with reconciling advances in technology with artistic form. His turbine factory for the AEG Power Company was completed in 1910. hundred years on, it's still producing state-of-the-art turbines, and it still looks inspirational. Like Schinkel before him, Behrens instinctively understood the beauty inherent in the industrial form through the marriage of glass and steel and brick. Believe it or not, this building changed the course of architecture. Modernism, an architectural movement that embraced the new, was born. By the 1920s, across the city, new visions of living and working were springing up. Berlin had become a cauldron of creativity. On its edges, pioneering architects were commissioned to come up with new homes to take the masses out of the overcrowded city. The Hufeisensiedlung, or horseshoe estate, designed by Bruno Taut, had more than 1,000 residences. Uncle Tom's Siedlung, built five years later, would accommodate twice as many again. These estates were like garden cities, boldly colourful, the fruits of a society that celebrated the new. Modernism now led, and where Berlin led, the rest of the world followed, or so it seemed.
From 1933, Berlin became Hitler's city. The rise to power of the Nazi party spelled the end of modernism, condemned by them as cosmopolitan rubbish. This estate was mainly home to communists. The emerging Nazi party regarded them, as well as the style of the buildings they lived in, as their enemies. Modernism itself was now on the firing line. But the Nazis were to take on their opponents with more than just jackboots. Just around the corner, a very different vision of Germanic identity was being built. The Nazis armed themselves with pitched roofs to combat the flat ones of modernism. It would be dubbed the Battle of the Roofs. The perfect chocolate box village, straight out of a grim fairy tale, with the pitched roofs and the folkish style. This place looks idyllic. But guess what? It was built in the late 1930s specifically for the SS as a model community. Today, this neighborhood, originally known as the SS Comradeship Estate, is once again very desirable. But whether it has managed to shake off its connection with Hitler's infamous security force is less clear. Yeah, these, man, these Häuser sehen ja, well, they come ja aus dem aus dem Süden. Das sieht ja aus wie im Schwarzwald fast, nicht wahr? Die SS Weil hätten nie unter einem flachen Dach gelebt. Nein, nein, ah, genau. Ja. Man, das ist ja komisch, wenn man sich vorstellt, dass die das in dem gleichen Garten dann ähm, die Kinder von SS-Mitarbeitern hier rumgespielt haben, dass diese Familien hier gelebt haben, muss doch komisch sein. Ja, also. gut, wir leben nur heute natürlich in einer anderen Na Zeit. Klar, das leben hier Aber es ist die Vergangenheit, die immer noch in Berlin ja, herumschwirrt. Ja, ja, wir haben uns hier sehr schnell sehr wohl gefühlt. Wir hm. haben also wunderbare Nachbarn ringsum. Es gibt da also eigentlich überhaupt keine Probleme. Es ist ein Zusammenhalt in der Siedlung, ist auch gegeben. Also hier wohnt eine sehr glückliche Gemeinschaft von, ja, muss von so Berlinern. Sagen. Muss man so sagen. Gespenster äh, rütteln sich. Ja, und wenn Sie sich den Hochsommer vorstellen, wir haben ja jetzt Frühjahr, aber wenn Sie sich den Hochsommer vorstellen, Sie können dann also praktisch in der Badehose hier mhm. äh, fünf Minuten, mhm. dann können Sie in die Krumme Lange reinspringen. Ja. Das ist einfach... Äh, Wunderbar. Ide eine Idylle. Ja. In December 1930, a young architectural student named Albert Speer heard Hitler at a rally. He was enthralled and his life transformed. Within three years, Speer was working for Hitler and the pair were inseparable. Together, they planned to transform Berlin into Germania, a new capital for the Third Reich. Speer would build on Schinkel's legacy to create a new city of the future that would last for a thousand years. A huge north-south processional route would cut through the center of the city. At its northern end would be the heart of Germania itself, the Große Platz. So this is where it would have been. The giant square, der große Platz. To the west, Hitler's own palace. To the east, the existing Reichstag. To the north, the crowning glory of Germania, the People's Hall, the Volkshalle. Its dome 16 times higher than the dome of St. Peter's. Just imagine. And then to the south, at the end of a grand avenue, the largest triumphal arch in the world. 
dwarfing the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. In fact, everything in this city would have been designed to dwarf everything in it and around it. Speer was so excited about his plans, he showed them to his father. The old man looked at them and then said, you've all gone bloody mad. But for the young architect, it was the opportunity of a lifetime. Put yourself in Speer's shoes. You're given a blank canvas, unlimited funds, a workforce at your disposal, and the chance to remodel Berlin and turn it into one of the grandest cities on the planet. I'd be tempted. And so, of course, was Speer. He wanted to be Schinkel to Hitler's king, and he took Schinkel's neoclassicism to new square-jawed heights. But in the process, he was making a pact with the devil. Berlin was to host the 1936 Olympics. Hitler asked Speer to oversee the building of a vast new stadium to demonstrate to the watching world how to put on a show. Nazi style. The games were deemed by the Nazis to be such a huge success that Hitler commissioned Speer to build another stadium four times the size of this one, in which Berlin alone would host the Olympic Games every year. The the beginning of Berlin. On a residential side street south of the city, there remains an extraordinary monument to their bloated vision. You could call this Hitler's folly, a vast slab of concrete which bears witness to the scale, the enormous scale of the Nazis' ambitions for Berlin. here in 1941. The sole purpose of this slab was to see whether the marshy soil of Berlin would literally take the weight of Hitler's ambitions for Germania. This was to be the site of Hitler's giant triumphal arch, the southern gateway to Germania. But guess what? It didn't work. The slab sank into the boggy soil of Berlin and has remained there ever since, an unintended monument to Hitler's hubris. However, the groundwork for Germania was laid across the city. Even today, under a park in the center, Berlin still retains some dark secrets from those preparations. Hello, 
Hallo. So trifft man sich im Wald hier. Ja. Aber nicht zum Picknick. So schon. Hallo. Okay, ja, top. Matthias. Off we go. Very good. Okay. Okay, wunderbar. Runter geht's. Also ich schätze mal 8 Meter. Aha. Wow. Amazing. It's like a sort of subterranean Venice from hell, this place. Of course, this is one of the very few bits of Germania that was actually built and survives to this day. And guess what it was supposed to be? An underpass for cars, so that the central junction next to Großer Platz in Germania wouldn't be cluttered with traffic. Hitler hated traffic jams. Of course, it's now as silent as the grave. In the end, the Führer's lust for war overtook his dreams for Berlin and Speer's grandiose plans were put on ice. Germania was crushed before it had even risen, and Speer fell to earth like Icarus. At the Nuremberg trials, he was sentenced to 20 years imprisonment for his part in the madness. On October the 1st, 1966, an aging Albert Speer was finally released from Spandau prison. As he drove slowly through the still ruined streets of Berlin, he tried to imagine what his Germania would have looked like. After 20 years of perspective, Speer realized his own youthful hubris, but also his complicity. And Germania, rather like Atlantis, would remain a city forever lost in myth. This is Tempelhof Airport. It's been called the mother of all airports. Built by the Nazis, it continued serving the city until recently. Now it stands empty, its future uncertain.
It's a remarkable, spooky building that poses for me an almost unanswerable question. This is still one of the biggest buildings in Europe today. I mean, there's no doubt that it's impressive or inspiring. I mean, just look at the dimensions of it. And of course, that's exactly the way the Nazis intended it to be. But here's the question that bothers me. Am I allowed to like a building that was constructed by a regime like the Nazis? Is there such a thing as original sin and morality in architecture? There are other buildings in Berlin that have their confessions to make. jetzt schon 18 Jahre in diesem Gebäude. Abends war keiner mehr so im Haus, nur die Putzleute eben. Das war eben wirklich sehr gespenstisch manchmal. This is the German Ministry of Finance. It used to be the Nazi Ministry of Aviation. Also der Keller hatte teilweise Räume, wo eben so Kucklöcher in den Türen waren, dass man annahm, dass dahinter Verhörungsräume waren wo eben die Soldaten oder eben Desertierte, die dort unten ver, äh, verhört werden oder wurden. Dieser Geruch der Soldaten, der Kleidung und äh, der Lederstiefel, der, der war einfach noch vorhanden. Das konnte man einfach noch riechen und ja, hören, die Stiefelabsätze, die da lang marschiert sind. Und das ist das, was ans, äh, damals noch, und das ist ja nun schon viele Jahre her, äh, doch noch ganz schön äh, hängen geblieben ist in dem Geist. Kann man das eigentlich nicht wegwischen? Da kann man noch so viel putzen. But Berlin is a city that simply won't give up. A succession of new, old buildings keep appearing. They acknowledge rather than deny their history. The Neues Museum, damaged by Second World War bombers, was left abandoned as a ruin for over half a century. Today, the remnants of its original features have been integrated into a spectacular new building. And the Reichstag, traditional seat of the German parliament, was rebuilt by Sir Norman Foster for the 21st century. It 
a marriage of old and new, and it boldly incorporates into its design the graffiti left by victorious Russian soldiers in 1945. But there is one expanse of sand in the very center of Berlin that more than any other demands resolution. It's the spot where until recently the Palace of the Republic stood. Now, remarkably, plans are in place to rebuild the old royal palace, the Schloss, in the very same spot where it once stood. Another new old building. It's a proposal that divides Berliners. Wichtig ist es für Sie, dass das Schloss neu gebaut wird jetzt, Herr Wolf. Was ich davon halte? Ja. Ich finde es großartig. Und was glauben Sie? Ich finde es völlig unsinnig, das neu zu bauen. Unsinnig und großartig. Und wieso? Weil das Schloss keine so positive große historische Bedeutung hat, dass man da unbedingt viel Geld reinstecken muss. Und was haben Sie, Herr Wolf? Das kann ich überhaupt nicht verstehen. Also, dass Sie als ältere Dame eine solche Meinung haben, ist es städtebaulich wichtig, dass hier wieder das Schloss hinkommt und nichts anderes. Was sagen Sie jetzt dazu? Auf diesem Platz, wo das Schloss mal stand, stand doch etwas. Warum hat man das? Abgerissen. Warum hat man das nicht gelassen? Und sehen Sie Ihre Meinung? Das, was Sie meinen, der Palast der Republik, mhm. ich habe nichts gegen den gehabt. Der ist, sage ich, immer noch völlig deplatziert, sowohl in städtebaulicher Hinsicht, nicht wahr? Er gehört da nicht hin. Für Sie war die Demolierung des Schlosses die Verschüttung der Vergangenheit und für Sie war die Demolierung des Palastes der Republik die Verschüttung ja. der Vergangenheit. Also haben Sie beide recht. <laughs> For as long as arguments like these continue, Berlin will remain restless. And this is what makes it unique. A new city still coming to terms with its past. And this story ends where it began, in a large empty patch of earth right in the heart of the city, a blank canvas onto which Berlin can construct yet another image of itself. For a free open university guide to Berlin and more about the German language and culture, Call 0845-366-8013 or go to bbc.co.uk slash Berlin. <laughs>